Bank of America is back in the spotlight. Iceland is doing very well, thank you. And Jamie Dimon gets a big raise. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Monday. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This here is David Hansen. David, as always, our show is brought, brought to our listeners today mm -hmm. by The Motley Fool. And we've got a special report that, uh, that WT Myers can get for free. All they have to do is email Warren. That's Warren Buffett's last name, Warren at fool.com. That's his first name, but... Warren Buffett's... Oh, it is his first name. It's his name. His name's Warren Warren. <laughs> Warren Warren. Weird name. Warren, Warren at fool.com. Fool and they can get a, a report uh, going over some of Warren Buffett's greatest wisdom. Cool. Uh, last night, David, was the Grammys. Royals by Lord won the top song of the mm -hmm. year. What would you have picked for the top song of the year? Of 2013? 2013. Hungry Like a Wolf, Duran Duran. <laughs> that came out last year, right? That did not come back that oh, last close. year, but you want to dig it up, bring it back, and have it win. Yeah, remix. You know, I, I kind of doubt that it won the first time around. <laughs> I don't think it did. All right, out of touch, David, just a little bit. Let's go to the headlines. Hopefully you're in touch more here. First is from Reuters. We got an exclusive. Bank of America's trading practices have been probed. Filing shows. Uh, the probe here, David, this is a, a gentleman named Eric Beckwith. Who is, uh, who is at B of A, and, and uh, this is from FINRA's broker check website. It, it says that there's an investigation ongoing, mm -hmm. that there may have been some improper trading on the swaps desk at Bank of America that was ahead of, of some big um, block trades. Some good old front running. Front running, yeah, big time. I thought it was interesting the way they, uh, I guess the investigators are claiming the incident was unsophisticated tradecraft using hand signals and special ringtones. I'm really curious about what ringtones oh. they were using. Hand signals? I bet they I were like using that. Hungry Like a Wolf ringtones, and that meant the trade is on. But I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, we were talking before. I'm not really sure what this means to Bank of that America. Means stop. Whether stop it's a, trading. a Bank of America issue Go or an Eric Beckwith issue, I'm not really sure yet. I think it's a little too early in the process to say whether this means anything. Sure. And the... The um, at least from what I saw, it wasn't clear what time period the investigation was right. covering. Beckwith has been with, or had been with, I should say, Bank of America going back to 2004. And what's also interesting is you mentioned, is this a Bank of America issue or a Beckwith issue? Um, he the, the notification of the investigation went out June of 2013. Mm -hmm. As of July of 2013, Beckwith is no longer with Bank of America. So, I, I mean, it could be that I don't think this is a crazy thing to think. Bank of America didn't know this was going on. Uh, they found out. They fired him. Right. Um, so that's at least one interpretation, but of course it could be something bigger than that. Let's move on to the second headline. Second headline. Uh, very interesting headline uh, about Iceland. Iceland, right? From Bloomberg. It says, let banks fail is Iceland mantra as 2% joblessness in sight. So Iceland, they were one of the, the big stories coming out of the financial crisis, how they had built up their financial system and it basically failed, and the government let banks fail and default on their debt there instead of bailing them out like we did here in the U.S. with some of our institutions. And fast forward to today, unemployment sitting around 4% mm -hmm. with the goal of 2%. How the heck did they do this? You know, I found the Iceland story a really interesting one, for, for one, because they dealt with the banking sector so much differently than we did, whereas uh, we dumped a lot of money into, into bailouts, into short-term support and that sort of thing. Iceland sort of said to the banks, hey, go suck it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's been the policy that's held forward to today. The other thing, the other reason that I find Iceland particularly interesting is Iceland also happens to be one of the happiest places on earth in terms of the, the people who live there. And, and I've, I've wondered for a while whether the two are connected. That approach to dealing with the banks and the economic fallout from the financial crisis and the, uh, the, the happiness of the residents. Um, I, I think one temptation here is to think this is a solution that could work everywhere. Mm -hmm. And as Iceland continues to see its economy recover so well, um, maybe there's, there's some research to be done to figure out whether this is something that could be done the next time around, and big banks may want to watch out for that. However, this is a very small island country. Right. Um, and one of the, this is from the Bloomberg article, um, this is from Prime Minister Sigmundur Gunlogsen, I hope I pronounced that I'm right. Sure you did. Uh, he says his main goal while in office is to rebuild the Icelandic welfare state. So I don't think we really think of the U.S. as a welfare state. I guess it depends on who you ask. Some people <laughs> do think it's a welfare state. Um, so translating that kind of approach over to the U.S. may be difficult. 
But I think there's some, there's some real, a hard look needs to be taken at what Iceland did and what the results have been. Right, I don't think you can say U.S. should have done that and we would have 4% unemployment right. because the U.S. capital markets, not just the banking system, but the whole markets that, whether it's banks, other companies that depend on those markets, that's what was the main issue during the financial crisis, not necessarily a bank failing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you look at comments from Jamie Dimon, he says the U.S. has the deepest, most sophisticated capital markets and we need them to, to stay that way. So maybe not as an easy a situation as Iceland had. All right, third headline, speaking of Jamie, that, look at that guy, look at that big smile. Big He's raise, happy. big raise, this is the New York Times, big raise for Jamie Dimon, uh, J.P. Morgan's Dimon, despite a rough year. He better be happy, his pay almost doubled from 2012, right? So we talked about this a little bit on Friday. Uh, this is now official. He made $11.5 million in 2012, 2013, up to 20 million dollars. I know, David, you weren't totally crazy about the idea of him getting a pay, pay bump for last year. Not crazy about it. And the article had a quote from Warren Buffett. Oh, I was going to read I that. I didn't quote. know if, was that a recent quote from like I, Friday? I I'm not sure where they were. He said that before. Um, Bu Buffett has said something to that effect. Yeah, before, he said, I he said, I think he's quote. worth more than that. Yeah. Worth more than he's getting, which if Buffett says it, I'm not going to say he's a total idiot because he knows his way around the boardroom. He knows what makes a good CEO. But it does make me wonder, with all this stuff with Diamond, if he was a kind of a meek, shy guy who maybe wasn't very good looking, <laughs> would he still be there? Uh, I'm really not sure. Uh, if this happened to Brian Moynihan, I don't think he would be getting a pay bump. I, I don't know. Well, does the guy that's not in the headlines always get the biggest pay? Well, in 2013, John Stumpf over at Wells Fargo, 19.3 million. Mm -hmm. So uh, this does put it in context for me, and I'm I'm the guy that's going to jump up there and defend Jamie Dimon and, and J.P. Morgan most of the time. But there is no way that for 2013 you can look at the pay that John Stumpf got and say, well, Jamie Dimon deserves more than that. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't. Right. Um, what I will do, just to finish off here, is I will finish that Warren Buffett quote because I like it. It's interesting mm -hmm. uh, that, that Buffett's jumping in here on this. Uh, he said, I think he's worth more than that. And he went on to say, overall, I think the shareholders of J.P. Morgan and the American people should be happy that Jamie Dimon has been running the bank over this period. It's pretty interesting. I'm sure some people would disagree. He's swinging hard on that he one. Is. All right, let's move on to the focus for today. Today we're taking a closer look at Visa and MasterCard, both companies are reporting uh, later this week. Mm -hmm. These are, they're great companies. Uh, they're companies that we've talked, I don't, you don't own either of them, do you? I do not. I don't own either of them either. Unfortunately. Um, but we both appreciate the business. And I think you took a closer look at what exactly makes these businesses tick so that we have a better perspective going into earnings season. Right, so the narrative we always hear about these two companies is, man, there's so much opportunity for payments to move electronically as opposed to cash. And these companies are just gonna take advantage of that and it's gonna be all great for them and they don't have to worry about anything. So that's the narrative, but then I don't think a, a lot of people take the time to understand how are they actually making their revenue in the long run. Uh, I'll start by saying how they don't make their revenue and then we can kind of narrow it down that way. So Visa and MasterCard, Where they do they? not- Selling semiconductors. They do not do that. <laughs> uh, but they also do not issue the cards or extend the credit. They are not the, when you swipe a Visa card, they're not extending the credit to you. It's the Bank of America or JP Morgan, whoever the bank is behind that credit card. They're just using Visa's network to facilitate the payment. They also do not charge merchants fees directly. So if you're a grocery store, you're not paying Visa directly. You're not paying MasterCard directly. You're paying your acquiring bank, your merchant bank. Uh, and that is where Visa and MasterCard sit in the relationship. They facilitate between the merchant's bank and the issuing bank, whoever is behind the card that's being swiped, the debit card that's being swiped. So they're in that relationship. They're charging the acquiring bank mm -hmm. and the issuing bank. They're not charging the merchants. They're not charging you as a customer. So that's kind of where they sit. And they, they get a percentage of kind of what the total payment is uh, for, for the cards, <clears throat> and also a fee per transaction between those two entities. So they there. get it's it's a it's a dual fee. So it it, is. so it's a per, there's something tacked on to every transaction. Yes. And then the total volume for that bank, mm -hmm. they charge a fee based on that as well. Correct. Okay. Um, so, so those are those are how it breaks down uh, in terms of uh, the bigger part of it is the transaction volume. So it's a percentage of the total amount of dollars or whatever currency is being spent on the card. They get a percentage of that. 
and then a smaller part of their revenue is per transaction, uh, each swipe that, that they Okay, so, take. and then if we think about the, the string of relationships we have here, when you say you make a transaction, I, I, the purchaser, give the merchant my card, merchant swipes the card, that sends it off to a processor, right? Mm -hmm. And then the processor interacts with the, the, the issuing bank. Right. Or the, yeah, yeah that, we have a picture there for you, they, those oh, of you watching. Man. So the acquirer goes through MasterCard to reach the, the issuer. And the reason MasterCard and Visa exist, it would be very messy for everyone's... Did that? Beautiful. I, I did not. That is courtesy of MasterCard. Okay. Um, Maybe it, we should tweet that for people who are listening. We can tweet that. Uh, it would be very messy if every merchant's bank had to go find the issuing bank and make sure that the funds match up, make sure it's real and secure. So MasterCard is basically the middleman to say, everything's okay, mm -hmm. we have everyone's information, everyone's gonna get paid, and we're gonna take a little bit, a slice of the pie too. And we should say, in the, in the fees that merchants get charged, uh, you hear anything between two, three percent. So if there's a hundred dollar purchase, the merchant might only end up with $97. Of that three dollars that's going to the various entities, it's smallest at Visa and MasterCard. Most of that is going to the issuing bank. Okay. Because if you think about it the, the way that, uh, of, of a risk reward, the issuing bank is taking the most risk by extending the credit. Right, uh, okay. Ma Visa and MasterCard aren't taking a lot of risk. They are taking some, uh, but it's going across their payments. So they're getting a smaller percentage of that potential $3. But then when you talk about what it costs merchants and then what it costs consumers in the eventuality, the fees f all flow through, right? Correct. So, yeah, so they're so, essentially being passed Right. So, so the fees come from the merchant's bank and they say, hey, you, we're gonna, you're only going to get $97. And then they make the, the payments accordingly to all the parties there. Now, from an investment perspective, we visited this question many times over, but what, do you have a preference between Visa and MasterCard or are you going outside those two? Reading over uh, their filings, I think I'm going with Visa in terms of the one I prefer because one of the risks that, that MasterCard calls out and says, hey, we're not the biggest one in the space, and as this space becomes more competitive, pricing is going to be an issue, and Visa has this wide range, they have bigger scope, they have more merchants on, under their, or more banks under their umbrella, they might have the advantage in terms of pricing. So if there becomes pressure on margins, I think Visa would have a better opportunity to, to maintain those margins than MasterCard. Okay. In, in the past, I, I would have jumped to agree with you, and, and primarily for that reason that Visa has the big network, has the, the head start in terms of, of size. Uh, but you know what? One, one thing that backed me off a little bit is Visa's got new, relatively new management in there in Charles Scharf. Uh, I, I don't have reason to doubt Scharf, mm -hmm. but he came over from J.P. Morgan. He was with their uh, private equity arm, and before that, he was running their uh, retail bank, uh, which is which is good. There's obviously overlap there, but the banking part of this uh, part of this business isn't the same as right. the technology and the processing business. So I think Scharf has some proving to do in terms of whether he's the guy to run it. Um, to be fair. Um, Joe Saunders, who ran uh, Visa before, he came over from a bank as well, and he had. It's not like he was a long-time right. Visa guy. He came in 2007, and mm -hmm. Visa had great results then. Uh, what I will say about Mastercard is, when you think about the greenfield opportunity in credit cards, most of that is overseas. And Mastercard points out that 85% of transactions around the world still happen in mm -hmm. cash. Most of that is outside the U.S., not in the U.S. And. Uh, uh, C uh, the CEO of MasterCard has a lot of past experience prior to, to MasterCard uh, working in the Asia Pacific region, working in the EMEA region, that's the uh, uh, Middle Eastern region, that uh, Europe and Middle East in there. Uh, and when you look at the revenue breakdown between Visa and MasterCard, more of MasterCard's revenue, in fact, more than, the, more than half of uh, MasterCard's revenue comes from outside the U.S. And the disparity between uh, the non-U.S. revenue for Visa and MasterCard is much smaller than the disparity in the size mm -hmm. of the businesses. Right. So I think MasterCard has good opportunity to compete on a very level basis with Visa internationally. Fair enough. You bet. All right, mailbag. We have an email address. Our email address is WTMI at fool.com. Send us an email. We love to get emails. Uh, we love answering questions on this show. And we've got a question here today from Darren. The question is, what do you think of Genworth Financial currently trading at 0 0.5 times book value despite doubling in 2013? Uh, David, 
this is mortgage insurance, this is life insurance. The, the, the business line that I particularly like of theirs, it's called international protection, mm. which sounds like, I mean, it sounds like they're running a CIA <laughs> operation out of there. It's actually uh, income protection, right. but it's much cooler when mm -hmm. you think about it. So when you think about this business, why, first of all, does it interest you? Semi. Semi. I'm semi interested in the turnaround story here, and it has turned around. I think so committal. Of you. I think the stock has doubled over the last year or so, right? It's still trading at 50% discount to book. Uh, on the recent conference call, the CEO said, in terms of getting ROE back to kind of a normalized level, maybe eight percent or so, he says we're probably only in the second or third inning of the turnaround. So this I'd is. I hope so. It's going to be a while, and if we think about, it, we're already five years out from the financial crisis, and they're still only in the second inning. Maybe there's still time to turn around and they made comments of saying, we really want to get to a point where we can pay more dividends, do more, more buybacks. So they're saying the right things, uh, but the collection of businesses are, it's kind of a, a motley collection of businesses here. I mean, you mentioned the international protection, they have international mortgage insurance mm -hmm. in Australia, UK, they have mortgage insurance here, life insurance, or long-term care. So I'm not sure where the strategy fits in, but semi-interested at the price. I, t to me, the only reason that this looks good is because of the low valuation. And I actually, I have what I call my Benjamin Graham portfolio, which is essentially it's a group of a group of companies that I invest in just because they are uh, trading at beaten down mm -hmm. multiples. Um, and I, I have a very specific strategy that goes along with that. Um, Genworth is actually in that portfolio, so, but that's the only reason. I don't have an interest in making this a real like a. a regular position mm -hmm. in my portfolio. Because even when we look back prior to the financial crisis, this wasn't a business that earned particularly attractive returns. Um, and when I think about the, the life insurance industry and life insurance business, which is a very, that's really the driver here that we need to be thinking about, uh, that's a hugely competitive business. Mm -hmm. and, and when I think about the, um, the other players in this industry, I, I think you have better investment uh, options. Even, even despite the, the low valuation here, again, if, if you just want a low valuation, can Genworth recover from this? Yeah, you'll probably mm -hmm. see some some gains from the multiple expanding. Um, but as a business, I'm just not crazy about it. Not seeing a double over the next year again? I, I, I don't doubt it. Okay. All right. But I could be putting my foot in my mouth there. Let's hope so. You just made me make a prediction. I don't like making predictions. <laughs> All right. We've got a game for today. Usually the game for Mondays is... Um, Making the grade. Making the grade. But I wanted to do a special game today because we saw all of those drops on the, on, on the stock market last week. We've got a lot of people talking correction, correction, correction. We don't really like that talk. But at the same time, every once in a while, the stock market does go down 10%, 15% um, before recovering. So I thought it would be a, a good time to visit. If the market had one of these, we'll call it a correction because that's what people like to call it. If the market had a correction of 10 to 15 percent, what are maybe the top three stocks that are on your list that you'd want to add to your portfolio? The first two, I'm going to group them together. We never talk about these. Visa and MasterCard. <laughs> uh, they're going to be my first two if the market had a correction. And MasterCard's down, I think, 8 percent this year already, but not going to get too much into whoa, that. It's, it's crashing. It's practically bankrupt. Um, but if we look at kind of, uh, we have a graph here. Oh, That's thank a crash. You. <laughs> we have a graph here That's of like the, the, worst sound on our the payment volume <laughs> by network. Visa and MasterCard. Visa owns 57 percent. This is as of 2012. 57 percent of the world's payment volume. MasterCard, 32 percent. So almost 90 percent of the world's payment volume is going through these two companies. People are not going to just stop using credit cards whether there's a market crash, whether there's actually a crisis, a credit crisis, et cetera, people are still going to be paying uh, with their cards. And over the long run, maybe there's a crisis and inflation goes up. Well, like we just talked about, they get a percentage of the payment volume. So they kind of got a natural built-in inflation hedge there as well. So maybe there's rampant inflation at this next uh, market crash. They'll still be doing okay. So I'm going with them. So, and both so of them I had, in the, sorry, in the previous segment, I, had, I made you choose between Visa and MasterCard. Do you think that's the wrong way to go? Do you think it's really about choosing the credit card business and buying both of them? I think that's very reasonable. And both of them have amazing balance sheets too. I mean, you look basically no debt here. They're not dependent on, on long-term debt at all. MasterCard's balance sheet is pristine. All right, go, go, go to your third. My third one is, Ber is Berkshire Hathaway. Pretty easy one. The collection of businesses, 
again, those are still going to be doing business regardless of what's happening For in the, the market. Think people will still be buying underwear. Enormous, <laughs> enormous cash pile uh, at Berkshire to take advantage of any opportunities they have. And if, say, it fell 25%, it'd be trading right at or 25%. Just, just below book value. We're talking about a big correction here. I said 10 to 15%. Yeah, well, that's you're, you're it's nothing. You're going with 25%. You're going 25%. It'd give me down near book value. Berkshire can make the returns over time to, to give you a nice return there. All right. But, you know, my do you, do you own any of those three? No, they're on my list for when the market correction happens. Okay, so so here I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go a little bit of a different direction, and when st the stocks that are on my list, I have I have stocks that I have on my list for further research mm -hmm. that that maybe could be added to my portfolio sometime. But generally speaking, if I have opportunity to buy uh, stocks, I want to be ready to add to stocks that I already own um, because those are, those are the ones, those are the businesses that I know the best. Mm -hmm. um, and if I think that they get to a place where they are, uh, where it's an opportunity to invest more at a good price, I'm going to do it. So from my list, and this, these are stocks that I already own, that if the market went down, I would be locked and loaded and ready to add more to these. Markel? Especially insure, uh, Citigroup, which we talk about to, to no end on here, and from outside the financial sphere, Amazon.com. Oh, interesting. And I didn't know that was allowed. I thought it was only financials in here. It, it wasn't allowed, but I decided to break the rules. Okay. Breaking the rules. I, I'm going to add one curveball here to finish off. If there was a stock that went down twice what the market did during this correction, so if we're going to go with your crazy 25% correction, 50%, if a stock went down 50% and there wasn't any you know business destroying reason for that extra fall what stock would you pick up so it gets substantially cheaper from where it is today visa okay all right mine was mastercard fair enough yeah you bet uh let's finish off today as we always do in the twitter sphere before i give you the tweet before i kick it over to you our twitter address at tmf financials mm -hmm. follow us go do ahead it. david What's do the tweet? it First tweet is from Jordan Wathen, our own Jordan Wathen. He's at JWTHN. It says, mortgage rates, the shockingly high price for high dividends. And he links out to an article he wrote. This is a really interesting article. He's looking at the mortgage rate sector uh, going back to the early 1970s. And we usually talk about the sector as kind of being up and coming. A lot of mortgage rates have formed in recent years. Mortgage rates did exist uh, in the early 70s. They've changed a lot in terms of how they invest. But he had a, a shocking fact in there that uh, investing from the beginning of 1970, I forget the particular year, investors would have lost 94% of their principal investing in like the index of mortgage rates. Granted, with the dividends, you would have made around 700% over the 40 years, which came out to 6% or so annually. So okay. worse than what the S&P has returned uh, annually over that time period. And the interesting fact was there was one group of mortgage rates that outperformed over that time, mm -hmm. and it was the agency mortgage rates. And Jordan's point was uh, they don't have to worry about credit risk. And non-agency mortgage rates do great during, during the good times. We look at uh, a company like Two Harbors. They dabble in the non-agency rate space. Uh, when credit conditions are good, their returns look great. Mm -hmm. But when things go sour, they're exposed to poor underwriting. Sure. Uh, we saw during... The financial crisis, Annaly Capital was fine because they didn't have to worry about defaulting mortgages underlying their assets. Non-agencies do. So I thought that was a very interesting point that over the long run, agencies uh, have done better because they can weather those bad times. All right, let's go to the second tweet. Second tweet, we've got Eddie Elfenbein. That's at Eddie, E-D-D-Y, Elfenbein. The bank of Starbucks? Last quarter, Starbucks sold $1.4 billion in gift cards. They invest in short-term debt, and those gift cards pay 0%. It's funny that, that we're looking at this tweet because I was just railing on the idea of gift cards uh, just yesterday, or Saturday it was. I, I don't understand gift cards, and I, it, the reason that I don't understand is exactly what Eddie is talking about here. They are such a good deal for the companies that issue them, and they are such a bad deal for anybody who buys them because as soon as you take cash, which you can take and you can spend anywhere, mm -hmm. and you turn it into a gift card that you can use at just one place, you've lost value. Congratulations, mm -hmm. you've lost value. And for that value, you get nothing. If I go to Starbucks and I take $25 and I turn that into a Starbucks gift card, I get $25 worth of value at Starbucks. That's plus the, not- Plus the little star rewards that go into your little cup on your app. 
Great. <laughs> you get Great. That. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's worth it. What, what I think companies should be doing is giving some sort of discount. So if mm. I spend $25, I should get $27 or $28. But you got to say, and, and when, and when you, you look at what Eddie's talking about here, it's a great deal for companies. Very so good. if they can get away with it, why not? They do. Get away with it. Finish this off last All right, week. final tweet is from Uberfax. The world record for having a ferret in your hands <laughs> is a whopping five hours and 30 minutes. That's How long amazing. could you have a ferret in your pants? <laughs> could you break that record? I don't know. What, what I want to know is what is it that happened after five hours and 30 minutes? That, that, made that person like, all right. say, all right, that's it. That's what enough. is the last animal you would want in your pants for five hours and 30 minutes? <laughs> um, tiger. Snapping turtle for me. <laughs> you don't want that in Snapping there. Snapping turtle's pretty bad. Yeah, you don't want that. Um, all right, so in just about a week, right, mm -hmm. or a little bit more than a week, we're going to be coming up on our 100th episode. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it's already here, but our 100th episode. We're going to be having a little bit of a viewer and listener competition going on with that. We'll be bringing more details uh, in the next couple of days, but the WTMR should keep tuning into that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's big, man. It 100, is very 100 big. episodes. 100, is. What are Huge. you going to do to celebrate 100 episodes? Oh man, not shave for 100 days. Let's see what happens. I'm, gonna, I'm holding you to that. I am <laughs> totally holding you to that. All right, that's our show for today. Uh, follow us on Twitter at TMF Financials. We're on Facebook, TMF Financial Services. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This is David Hansen. We'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.